very special. Paranormal Almanac. Halloween Spooktacular. Too hard to talk over. That's right. I'm your host, Kurt Sandvig, and on this week's edition of Paranormal Almanac, Spooky Edition, let's talk about some spooky, unsolved murders and mysteries, because you guys asked for this. You can only blame yourself. But first, as always, we have shout-outs. Shout-outs going out to the patrons. Head on over to patreon.com slash paranormalalmanac. Join up. Because of these patrons, this show happens more and more frequently and better and better, hopefully. So shout outs to Rick Foster, Nico Share and the Mouse. I like that. Nico Share and the Mouse. Andrew Stephen McDaniel, Paul, Mark, Tortuga, Hannah Boo, Mike from Jersey, Tuesday, Tuesday, Jay Bizzle, Andy, Tracy, Virginia Mailman, Tony, Jason, Vicky, Crow, Clay, Buzz, Tom, Lobito Works, Glacier Main, Isabel, Jen Jen, Stacy, Amber, Tracy, Sandy, Menace the Beast, Kick Ass Magic Robot Webcomic, Sandy, Paige, Kosh, Sean, Andrew, Scott, Andrea. Devin, Melody, Ricardo, Vicky, Vanessa, Marisol, Liam, Roger, Michael, Alicia, Becca, Jake, and the Beasties, Elizabeth, Voidtech, Sherry, Art Muffin, Trudy, Tim, Kenneth, Paul, Ricardo, Ian, Armor Times 10, Alexandra, George, Seth, Zozo the Demon, yay, yay, Hayden, Cindy, Ashley, what's that, Carrie, Robin, Lauren, and Phil Mangano, Russell, April, Isabel, Audra, Dorian, Cindy, Bob, Stacy, Jerry, Scoston, Lindsay, Megan, Jeff T, Harley, Suzanne, Joe, Lawrence, the Lauren Strawn, hey howdy hi, Veronica Autumn, J. Mark Manning, Carolyn Martin, Jade Nanashi, Chuck, Todd, Jamie, and Elijah, Elijah Hendrickson, Dan, Laura Pitts, and Gamer Fan. The only, the one, the only, the Gamer Fan. With two special shout outs, as always, to Joe Teague and to Stitch. All righty, let's uh, merch. Just head on over to tpublic.com slash stores slash Paranormal Almanac for all, Paranormal-Almanac, for all your Paranormal Almanac merch needs. It's coming down quick, man. It's 10, 10, 9 when I'm recording this. Probably 10, 10 when it's out if I don't get it out tonight. But you know, you got like 20 days left for those 200 shirts, and then they're gone forever, forever dead. Those shirts will be forever dead. Shout out to Fishboy, Rockin' Fishboy, forever dead. What a great freaking tune. Uh, let's see. Hand of Fate update. Get him in. Get your entries in now. Get him in. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Again, running out of time. Alrighty. In the weird shit that Kurt does news, I don't know what to call this segment. Um, my friend, uh, you actually hear her name on the uh, the shout outs. The, the Lauren and Phil Mangano. The Lauren of Lauren and Phil Mangano. The Lauren Woman Gano, if you will. Um, she was like, hey, check out this uh, estate sale coming up. And I went, I was like, oh my God, Mid-Century Modern. Like I looked at the photos online. I was like, oh, Mid-Century Modern. Oh yeah, this place is awesome. Yep. And then, you know, after 20 photos of just awesome killer Mid-Century Modern stuff that I would love, skulls, just nothing but skulls, just page after page of skulls. And I was like, oh yeah, we, we were going to this one. So my plan was for the patrons, it didn't work out. So patrons don't be like, where is it then? Because I'm telling you right now, it didn't work out. My plan was to video me at the estate sale and just show you just skull after skull after skull. Uh, what happened was we, so we got there. It was like five 30 in the morning yesterday morning. So Saturday morning, the eighth. Um, oh, and a special shout out to John Lennon since his birthday. Uh, before I get any further, there's another special shout out to John Lennon on his birthday, man. It still bums me out that he's not with us anymore. Um, all right, where was I? So, um, I just looked at the date. That's what reminded me. Um, Oh, yeah. So we get down there about 5.30 in the morning, a little after, maybe 6 o'clock in the morning. And our names are on the list. So you got to, you know, you have to put your name on the list. And then they just let people in, in, you know, a couple at a time kind of a thing. So we're like, all right, cool. We're not too, too far down. We're like, uh, I don't know. I'll, I forget. So I'll say 15 and 16. 
So we're like 15 and 16 in. I was like, all right, perfect. This is awesome. Let's, you know, let's, let's do this. But the problem is when you're about 15 or 16 in, you know that people are either going for the mid-century modern stuff or they're going for the skulls. And you're, you're, you know, you better get what you want to get as quickly as possible because again, only 20 people in at a time. And those people are running for, you know, quote X specific object. So I was like, shit, I'm not going to have a chance to really videotape this. I really want a skull. I think it'd be cool to have a skull on the background just for, just strictly for the, the live shows, which I'm, you know, I have to do more of because I've got skulls now. Spoiler, I got a skull. But uh, I was like, I got to get, I got to get a skull. So I went down there. I didn't have a chance to videotape it because like I said, it was just rush, run and get, run and get. I looked to my right. I saw, all right, it's not what I want for mid-century. So I'm going to go to my left. Go to the skulls. Lauren gave me this little tub thingy. So I'm throwing tubs, no, skulls in the tub. And I'm like, I'll figure it out later if I want to keep them or not. But um, yeah, I'm talking human skulls. I'm talking preemie baby skulls. I'm talking monkey skulls. I'm talking skulls with like barnacles on them and stuff. And seemingly very real. Some of them were obviously fake. You pick it up and be like, oh, this is plastic. But some of them are seemingly real. The one that I'm looking at in the, quote, eye sockets while I'm talking to you, seemingly very real. Now, the skulls all come from the TV show Bones. So if you ever watch TV show Bones, I now own a couple of skulls from the TV show Bones. I ended up buying, let's see, one, two, three, four, five skulls. I think I bought five skulls in total. Is that right? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, yeah. So I bought five skulls in total for, for various decorations because they were they were cheaper than I thought they were going to be. And I'm like, oh, that's freaking rad. And then, you know, a, a very cool mid-century modern piece. But so I'm now a proud owner. I get up early on the weekends to go buy skulls is what I'm telling you. That's that's what life around here is like for, you know, old paranormal almanac, almanac Kurt. Tale of terror. Yeah. Ah, Sir Graves, gotta love him. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking at a skull while I'm telling you guys these stories now. And there's two more behind me, three more behind me, four more behind me. They're all kind of scattered throughout. So when I do a live episode, someone say, hey, where's the skulls? And then I'll point them out to you or I'll just show them to you. But the one that's just here to my, my right, uh, it's got a knife wound in the back of the skull it's from episode, and I don't know, I haven't watched the episode yet, so it might be, I'm, I'm assuming it's very visible in the episode. It says, Henry Charles, episode 1120, Bones, on the base of it. So, if you're a, a Bones fan, or if you want to watch Bones, you can see my skull. If you want to see my skull, watch Bones, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I thought that was kind of fun. That was weird. I'm like, well, at least I get to update you guys. Unfortunately, I didn't get the video. That was what I really wanted to do for the patrons, was go like, just down these bookshelves of just skull after skull. There's a box of bones. Just the most bizarre estate sale I have ever been to. But uh, I dug it. I thought you guys would get a kick out of it. All righty, let's see. Uh, let's do uh, paranormal news, I guess. Welcome to Paranormal. The first story in paranormal news is a story that I've talked about a couple of times. And I also just talked about it recently with uh, Jenny Pugh, the psychic. A teenage camper films huge panther feeding on dead sheep in Peak District. It is no longer a cryptid. It is verified. There are large cats, you know, like whatever you want to call them. There are large cats, if you will, in, in England, in the UK. There is no longer a doubt about it because a teenage camper has filmed a big cat apparently feeding on dead sheep in the Peak District, sparking fears a panther is prowling the British countryside. Guess what? It has for decades because, again, it's been called a cryptid forever, but now no longer cryptid. This thing is real. There is a big cat in England and it's on film. Josh Williams, 17, was with his friend Ben Burns after a night of wild camping, it says, when they spotted the, annual, uh, the animal near Jacob's Ladder on Monday. Hi, Rum. How are you? You're a good girl. 
The, ke- the teen who captured the moment on his cell phone said they were walking from Mermaid's Pool on Kinder Scout towards Edale when they spotted what they first thought was a wild cat in a nearby field. Oh, yeah, there's the video. Yeah, that's a big old cat feeding on something dead. Uh, let's see. The creature sounded as if it was feasting on the carcass of another animal, possibly a dead sheep. Josh said he was convinced the animal was a big cat and resembled a panther, but could be not be entirely sure as the creature never turned around and was too far to see. No, it isn't. That's a big fucking cat. He said we were both confused when we first saw it. We stood staring at it and questioning what it could be for around five minutes before I decided to start recording so that I could zoom in and get a better look. All right, that's five minutes too long. When you see something like that, grab your phone, start filming. Um... We tried attracting its attention so it would turn and face us so that it can get a better understanding of what we we're looking at. We honestly had no idea what it could be if not a big cat. It was in a field of sheep with no different animal sound, no different animals around, and it appears to have a long black tail. Yeah, it totally has a long black tail. So it definitely wasn't a sheep. Yeah, it's not a sheep. It's a big black cat. And the story keeps going on, but you get the gist of it. So there we go. Another cryptid proven real. So I don't understand why people just immediately discount cryptids or cryptozoology look these big cat cryptids have been around for hundred years if not longer longer than that actually a couple hundred years they've been spotting big cats in the uk and then animal experts quote unquote uh would say no there's no big cats in england and then just boop that's it that's done moving on to the next no it's not moving on to the next there is a freaking big cat already up next one uh comes from newsweek fact check Does alien videos show UFO drawing energy from the sun? Interesting. Renewed activity from the U.S. military and the Pentagon seems to have re-energized fantasies and theories about the presence of life on alien planets. Yeah, no shit, because it's called disclosure. Um, In one recent social media post, footage of the sun was shown as proof of an alien spacecraft using the star's heat to refuel. A Reddit post published on October 5th shows what looks like a long black tornado-like thread protruding from the sun before disappearing. The caption reads, Aliens exist in front of everyone. NASA knows. The government knows. This is one of their ships caught refueling directly from the sun. Alrighty, where is the video? Um, I can't find the video. Oh, well, it doesn't matter because it says... Talking to scientists, they said it's a thing known as prominence, an area of cooler, denser plasma that's surrounding 3.5 million degree Fahrenheit corona that can extend thousands of miles into space. So it's not a UFO. It is called whatever the hell I just said it was, prominence. Ah, here we go. The footage shared on Reddit can be recreated through going here. Let me go here. I just want to see it. Okay. Then what? I mean, it's just a a big photo of the sun, but I don't see the thing they're talking about. Well, it doesn't matter. So apparently it's not really an alien UFO sucking stuff up from the sun. It's a thing called prominence. So with that, that means no, it is not paranormal news. We're going to move on to the next story, which probably, probably, hopefully is. Strange creature spotted in Loch Long could be, quote, Nessie on holiday. Jamie Houghton was bird watching when she spotted the Houghton. I don't know why I said Houghton. Jamie Houghton was bird watching when she spotted when he, sorry, he spotted the odd creature breaking the surface of the lock in Lock Long. Um, Jamie Houghton, 50, was bird watching at Lock Long when he spotted something odd in the water. The insurance broker from Derbyshire, Derbyshire, was shocked when he saw uh, saw a commotion on the surface of the water. He said it's difficult to say what size it was because it was some distance away. Sort of close to the middle of the lock. The pictures I took are zoomed in and cropped heavily just on a basic camera. All righty, let's take a look. Yeah, it's a big creature. You know, you know those photos of a whale's dick and they're like, you know, good lock. Could Nessie just be a whale's dick? This looks like a whale's dick with some, with some uh, seaweed on it. But I think it is. Yeah, that's what it says. It's a creature has dark mottled skin, appears to be covered in seaweed. I think it is the back end of a big ass fish. Very big ass fish, but I'll put it up on the Facebook fan page. I'll let you guys see and see uh, if you think it's uh, is it a seaweed covered whale's dick? Is it uh, what I think? Is it just a big ass fish or is it another Nessie? Could be. I'm not saying it's not. I'm not saying that. You can't tell me I'm saying that. All righty, up next, ghost story. 
The Walhalla Hitchhiker. Oh, is this that video? Let's see. Uh, nope, that's that's a cool guy. Stop Give me crappy crap. All right. No no free commercials on Paranormal Almanac. Look, if you want to per, uh, put a commercial on Paranormal Almanac, it's not going to cost you much, so you a ghost just do it. story from Oconee County. Some say this ghost appears on the side of a winding road trying to get somewhere. But in order to see him, the conditions have to be just right. Oh. It happens at night and in the yeah. rain. On Highway 107, a country road that winds through Walhalla. As cars approach a natural spring oh, come on, called get to Moody it. Springs, oh, Moody some Springs. have so go there. seeing a man looking for a ride. Dressed in a black raincoat and muddy boots. Deneen Chatsley is the communication supervisor for the Greenville County Library System. Right, she it. told us the story of the man known as the Walhalla Hitchhiker. They say that he is quiet, expressionless, pale. She says the hitchhiker reportedly asks for a ride to the nearby scenic overlook. Some drivers have also picked up the hitchhiker Why? at the overlook. Why would you possibly? And they say he asks to be taken to Moody Spring. So there is some special connection to these two locations. And when the car arrives at the location where the man wants to go, something happens. He mysteriously disappears upon arriving at his destination. And something from the rain-soaked hitchhiker is left behind. Oh. He usually leaves a wet spot in your car as, you. as the only evidence that you have left that, that you ran into this person. She so if you guys want a wet spot from a ghost, and frankly, who doesn't? There you go. By, by Moody Spring, Wahala, in Oconee, County, South Carolina, uh, Highway 107, the country road through Walhalla in Oconee County. All righty, so let me ask you this. Would you pick up a hitchhiker? Hold on, question's not done yet. I'm not done yet. Don't answer yet. Would you pick up a hitchhiker in a known haunted hitchhiker location just to see if the person that you're picking up, the, I was going to say the thing, but that's not me. That's mean. The person that you're picking up was a ghost because a I wouldn't pick up a hitchhiker sorry hitchhikers f that noise I don't want you I don't want some serial killer in my car sorry not happening but maybe just maybe if like I'm driving I'm like oh crap I'm on highway 107 look at that I'm in Walhalla I'm near Moody Spring or whatever the hell it was called and it's dark and it's raining hey look there's a guy in a black trench coat who's a hitchhiker maybe just maybe I would pick him up. But would you, that's my question, would you pick up this ghost hitchhiker? The best scenario is he gets out, disappears, and there's a wet spot in your car. And you've got a really funky story, like cra crazy funky story. Obviously, the worst case scenario is it's a serial killer knowing that people pick up hitchhikers, ghost hitchhikers in this area and will murder you and, uh, you know, eat you. But uh, would I don't know, would you risk it? I might, might, might. That'd be the only case where I possibly might pick up a hitchhiker is if I know there's a ghost hitchhiker in the area, which probably is not a good thing. All righty, finally in, in paranormal news, I want to get right to the story, so I'm going to jump ahead. Michigan considered one of the most haunted states in the United States, and here are the Michigan towns with the most ghost sightings. We got, um, where is it? Come on. There we go. Monroe County, 48 ghost uh, sightings. Muskegon County, 44. Bay City, 43. Saginaw, 32. Which is weird because that hotel that I want to buy is in Saginaw. The haunted hotel I want to buy, it's in Saginaw. 32. Paris, 30. Escoda, 28. Jackson, 28. Menemone, 27. Taylor, 26. Flint, 25. I don't know this one. Morenke, Morenci, 25. And Port Huron, 25. So there you go. If you want to, um, oh, and then some honorable mentions, Dearborn 24, Ann Arbor 23, Grand Rapids 23, Cadillac 21, Gross Point 21, Mackinac Island, very haunted location, only 21, and Warren County, where I grew up, 20 sightings. That's interesting. That's cool. So for all you Michiganders, there you go. Now you know where to go and get yourself a ghost. All righty, let's take a quick break, and uh, we'll do uh, Count Scary again to get us out of here. We'll be right back with more Paranormal Almanac. 
tale of terror. <laughs> tale of terror. <laughs> All righty, we're at the 9th of October. Probably the 10th when this comes out. Maybe I'll get it out tonight. I don't know. But do you have your Halloween decorations out yet? I like the fact. I not No, I don't like. I love the fact that people are like, hey, I've already had mine out for a couple of weeks, or I'm putting mine out right now while I'm listening to your podcast. That's the kind of stuff that I love. Look, don't be one of those adults that are like, man, I don't feel like putting out the, put your freaking Halloween decorations out. Make it spooky as crap for the kids. I, I, look, I just went and bought a bunch of freaking human skulls. So I'm doing my part. Just do yours, what I'm saying. But we are back. Another spooktacular edition. This one has been asked for repeatedly. And I kind of get it, but I also kind of don't get why. For some reason, murder and paranormal kind of go hand in hand. And I get it, you know, like, oh, there's a lot of paranormal, like, why did you become a ghost? Because they were murdered. So they're seen in the stairwell where they were murdered. You know, I get that part. But I mean, people's fascination with the paranormal also leads them to have a fascination with murder. So on this edition, this spooktacular edition, I said, all right, fine. I'll give the people what you want. You guys wanted a bunch of paranormal games you could play at home. And then I got people saying that the episode was boring. So let's try this one. People ask me for a bunch of murdery type episodes. Well, here's one right here. Let's talk about some unsolved mysteries that may or may not be paranormal, but they sure as hell are spooky. And I got to say, I'm just going to guess this episode's probably going to have one of the highest body counts of any episode. I don't go graphic. Don't worry. Um, but they'll be slightly graphic. But I don't, I'm not going to go too graphic. I'm going to give the details, and some of them are about, like, you know, murders. So you've been pre-warned. Now, the first one is called the West Mesa Bone Collector. So, from context clues, you should be able to guess what I'm about to tell you. Mesa Bone Collector. Now, I guess we should go back, well, to not when it's, well, I don't, I, we shouldn't go back to when it started, but when the like the first bone was found, I guess. So let's uh let's go on back to February second, two thousand nine. That's right. This one isn't even from like the twenties or the fifties. Like this is one you got to worry about. This one happened in two thousand nine. As far as I'm concerned, that's freaking recent. February second, two thousand nine. Christine Christine Ross was out walking her dog Ruka along a dried out wash bin wash area in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Oh, another special shout out to JD. I don't think he listens to this podcast, but it's his birthday today and he's from, or he's not from, he's in, he's in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Hold on. Let me take a quick drink. Uh, Here's a, here, just pretend I'm drinking alcohol. Here's to you, JD. All right. So she's walking her dog, Ruka. Christine's walking her dog, Ruka. Dried out wash, Albuquerque, New Mexico. When Ruka finds a bone, no big deal yet, but... Christine sees it and goes, hmm, yeah, that's a, that looks like a human femur bone. But she wasn't sure. So she takes a picture of the bone and messages her sister, who's a registered nurse, who went, uh, what the crap? That's a human femur bone. I'm assuming she was like, WTF, human femur, get the crap out of there. So Christine calls the cops. They look a little bit more. Another bone. Then another Then they start digging. That's when they find 11 bodies worth of bones buried all right where Christine went for dog walks. I can't tell you how much I love the fact that when I go for a dog walk, it's in a subdivision. Although, you know what, I'm sure if I looked into the statistics of serial killers, I probably have a higher chance of dying in a sub, uh, you know, like, in a suburban area than I do out in some weird wash in Albuquerque. But for my own sanity, I'm going to be like, whew, I didn't find 11 bodies worth of bones today. All right. It took nearly a year for medical examiners to identify some of the decomposing, some of the decomposed victims, most of whom were Hispanic, all of whom were female. Here's a shitty fact. Women, again, seem to love 
murder podcasts, yet the majority of the victims in these murder podcasts are women. That's terrifying, but okay, I'll give you what you like. So uh, the most were reported missing between 2001 and 2005. They ranged in age from 15 to 32 years old. So the police named this serial killer the West Mesa Bone Collector, as you know. And if you're thinking, well, I don't live in New Mexico, or at least, hey, that was 2009, Kurt, so they either caught him or I'm safe now. Well, the FBI's $100,000 reward for information on this serial killer has gone uncollected. The only emerging pattern was that 10 of the victims were sex workers or victims of sex trafficking. The 11th was that 15-year-old. She was found buried next to a 20, to her 27-year-old cousin. Both had disappeared after walking to a local park in 2004. Pretty much the only lead for all of this came from a satellite photo of the area, and they noticed that a 2004 image showed a set of tire tracks leading directly to the area. But by 2009, when the bones were discovered, development had erased any of the tire tracks or anything. But still, they were that close from like a Google image, satellite image, to seeing like the murder, the, the serial killer or the car or some kind of evidence. All right, so you might be asking, Kurt, any suspects? Well, two. Yep, that's right. There are two main suspects. Of those two, only one is still alive. Joseph, Joseph Blay was imprisoned when the bodies were found, uh, but he, so un, unrelated, he became a suspect, though, when his ex-wife contacted police because her daughter found women's clothing and jewelry in their home with some families later revealing that the victim's jewelry was missing. So she's like, ah, oh, crap. I think Joseph is um, the murderer. Then... Police encountered Blay nearly 140 times between 1990 and 2009 in drug, quote, drug-heavy areas that the victims were known to frequent. They also found electrical tape and rope in his car when he's arrested in 2003 for exposing himself to women. So this guy is just a fucking charm. Uh, police also saw him stalking sex workers after the West Mesa murders. Now, his cellmate said that... This guy admitted to knowing many of the murdered women and had even hit one of them for allegedly trying to steal his money. Sadly, unlike law and order, a lack of evidence failed to pin any of the murders on Joseph, and he's serving a 90-year sentence for sexual assault. Going back to the 80s, this guy's a fucking charm. Now, the other guy, Lorenzo Montoya, was known to pick up prostitutes and assault them. He even beat his girlfriend, who, th who he said threatened to, quote, to kill me and bury me in lime. Then, in 2006, he met up with a dancer, strangled to death. When her boyfriend arrived, though, he shot and killed Lorenzo. So, hopefully, one of these two idiots were this West Mesa bone collector. But with that remains an open case that sadly is a fact that I, when I really looked into this case, no one cares about solving it. None of the, you know, the police or you know, law enforcement, because, quote, it was only sex workers that died. How shitty is that? Like, that's a horrible way to get through life. Do your freaking job. It doesn't say to protect and serve unless you're a sex worker, so F that noise. But even though it, in my mind it sounds like they have the guy in prison or the other guy who's just dead, so... We should be safe from this specific serial killer. But how about this fun fact for you for this episode? Right now, there are between 25 and 50 active serial killers in the United States at any given time. Many of them have never been caught. In fact, there's probably a good chance that a serial killer has listened to my podcast. And let me just say real quick, if so... Please don't serial kill me. Even if you didn't like an episode or that new theme song that I tried out for you guys, don't serial kill me. But they say that serial killers often are intrigued by books, so I'm just extending that to probably and podcasts about this topic. 
My show is called Paranormal Almanac. It's not called Serial Killer Almanac, so hopefully they aren't listening. I really hope that a serial killer isn't caught, and then they go, oh, and then we went through his phone, and he loved this podcast called Paranormal Almanac. That's not the kind of press I want. I'm sure it would do wonders for my show, but I don't want that kind of press. All right. Horrendously, we're off with a body count of 11 and counting, so let's keep on going to the next one. To the Cleveland Torso Murderer. Yeah, not a great name, so still bad. For this one. We go back to the 1930s. Makes me feel a little bit safer. To Cleveland, Ohio, which, fun fact, didn't rock then. Cleveland didn't rock back then. But, again, there's a damn good chance this serial killer is dead. So, in my opinion, Cleveland rocks. Between 1934 and 1938, a serial killer murdered and dismembered at least 13 victims, which is bad, but it gets worse. Only two of the victims were ever positively identified, which I don't get that at all. You're telling me with today's 23andMe and all these DNA crap that they can't figure out who these sad victims are from the 1930s? Everybody go out and get one of those 23 and Me's, Because from what I've gathered from, again, these kind of murder podcasty things is it might help them find out who some of these victims are, or it might help them go, hey, did you know your grandpa was a serial killer? In which case, both good things. All righty. So this killer, officially unidentified, researchers today are quite certain they think they know Possibly, who decapitated all the victims. That's right, all decapitations. Now, the reason I added this one is because of who investigated it, though. I wasn't so thrilled about, like, another serial killer just because he had a cool name, not a cool name, but a weird name called the Cleveland Torso Murderer, but who investigated the Cleveland Torso Murderer. None other than Elliot Ness, one of the untouchables. If you don't know who Elliot Ness is, You should find out because there's a movie called The Untouchables, which is brilliant. It's got Sean Connery in it. But Elliot Ness was like the G-man, the guy that caught people, killers and everything. So the murders ended as abruptly as they began. To this day, the Kingsbury Run murders, or the Cleveland Torso murders, remain one of the most sensational, unsolved crimes in America. All right, we go back to September 1934. The Lady of the Lake victim is what she was called. When a young man finds the lower half of a woman's torso, thighs still attached but amputated at the knees, washed up on the shores of Lake Erie, just east of Bretonall. Sure, why not? The coroner noted that some sort of chemical preservative was on the skin, which had turned it red, tough, and leathery. That's going to happen a lot. They think that she was in her mid-30s. Head was never found, never identified, but they think whoever did this has medical knowledge. September 1935. A year later, two teenage boys discovered the decapitated corpse of a white male at the base of Jackass Hill, where 90, East, 90, East 49th Street, Kurt, come on, East 49th Street dead ends into Kingsbury Run. Body, naked except for a pair of socks, was cleaned and drained of blood again. Medical knowledge. Rope burns around both wrists. The coroner determined the cause of death, death, decapitation. Fingerprints identified this victim, though, as Edward Andrasi, a 28-year-old white male. He had a police record. They discovered a second body, though, nearby, again, decapitated. Again, same chemical preservative as that first victim, or his first two victims. Uh, Let's see. uh, That one was a 40-year-old male, never identified. January 1936, woman discovers half of a female body neatly wrapped in a newspaper and packed in two full full bushel back baskets. The baskets were alongside the Hart Manufacturing Building on Central Avenue near East 20th Street. Everything except the head was recovered about 10 days later in a vacant lot on nearby Orange Street. Fingerprints identified this victim, too, as Florence Polillo, waitress, barmaid, and sex worker. June 1936, Kingsbury Run. Two young boys discover the head of a white male wrapped in a pair of trousers close to the East 55th Street Bridge. Police find the body of 20-something the next day, a man, 20-something year old, and the next day dumped in front of the Nickel Plate Railroad Police Building, cleaned and drained of blood. 
Again, medical knowledge messing with the police. Uh, let's see. There, this body had a bunch of tattoos that were very distinctive, but they could never identify the victim. A plaster reproduction of the man's head, along with a diagram of the kind and location of the tattoos, were made to display in the Great Lakes Exhibition of 1936. Um, the tattooed man, as he was called, was never identified. The original death mask, along with three others from the case, are on display at the Cleveland Police Museum. July 1936, teenage girl finds a decapitated decapitated remains of a 40-year-old white male walking through the woods near Clinton Road and Big Creek on the west side. He had been dead about two months. His body was on top of a pile of bloody clothing. Um, they said that, that because of the amount and quantity of blood that had seeped into the ground, this guy had been killed where his body was found. September 1936, a homeless person trips over the upper half of a male torso while trying to hop a train on East 37th Street. Police uh, searched a nearby pool, but it was just basically a big open sewer, where they found the lower half of the torso, parts of both legs. They sent in a diver to make the recovery. That is the worst job ever. You're going in to a open sewer, quote-unquote, pool of murky water where you know there's a dead body. The police said that at least 600 onlookers came out to watch them find the body parts, and the killer was probably among them. Uh, February 1937, a man finds the upper half of a woman's torso washed up on the shore east of Brattonal, Brittonal, whatever. The lower half of the torso washes ashore three months later at about East 30th Street. Never identified. June 27th, or June 1937, teenage boy discovers a human skull under the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge. Next to it was a burlap bag connecting the skeletal, containing the skeletal remains of what turned out to be a petite black woman, about 40 years old. Dental work, nothing. Oh, sorry. Dental work. There's an unofficial, unofficial identification of Rose Wallace. Uh, July 1937, a young guard was out standing watch by the West 3rd Street Bridge. He saw the first piece of victim quote number nine in the wake of a passing tugboat. That's possibly the worst sentence I've ever read. He was out there just standing there by the bridge and saw something in the wake of a passing tugboat, and it turns out to be a piece of a victim. Over the next few days, police recovered the entire body except for the head from the waters of the Cuyahoga River. The abdomen had been gutted, heart ripped out, but again, medical precision. Never identified. April 1938, a young laborer on his way to work in the flats saw what at first he thought was a dead fish along the banks of the Cuyahoga River, but it revealed to be the lower half of a woman's leg. Victim number 10. A month later, police pulled two burlap bags out of the river, both containing parts of the torso and most of the rest of her legs. Hold on one second. All right. Sorry, I had to take a drink. August 18th, 1938, 12.40 a.m. Elliot Ness and a group of about 35 police officers and detectives raid the, quote, hobo jungles of the run. 11 squad cars, two police vans, three fire trucks come down onto this, quote, unquote, hobo jungle of the run where the Cuyahoga River twists behind Public Square. They say they gathered up 63 men, at police, at dawn, police and firemen searched the deserted shanties for any clues. When they couldn't find any, Elliot Ness says, set it on fire, and they burned the entire hobo jungle to the ground. July 1939. It's still going on because County Sheriff Martin O'Donnell arrested 52-year-old Bohemian bricklayer Frank Dolzale of the murder of Flo Polilo. He had lived with her for a little while, but... A uh, subsequent investigation revealed he had been acquainted with Edward Andrasi and Rose Wallace. So here's a guy that had three connections to, th or a connection to three of the victims. His confession, though, was, quote, a blend of incoherent ramblings and precise details. Police think he had been coached on what to say. Before he could go to trial, he was found dead in his cell. The five foot eight uh, Joseph, right, was that his name? Five foot eight, Frank, sorry. Five foot eight, Frank had hanged himself from a hook only five foot seven inches off the ground. 
Gerber's autopsy revealed six broken ribs, all of which had been obtained while in the sheriff's custody. So you might be thinking, oh, good. Well, he's dead. He probably killed all those people, so fuck him. Well, no. To this day, no one who's investigated everything about this case thinks that Frank Dolezal was the torso killer at all. They think that his confession was because of that uh, six broken ribs, you know, the police just beating the crap out of him until he confessed. Elliot Ness had a suspect who, who he believed was undoubtedly the killer, but he could never prove it. And get this, the killer kept taunting him for years after Frank's death. So, boom, not Frank. Okay, here's the problem while I was researching this one. All official police records on this case have been lost, destroyed, or removed. There are no more files to help armchair detectives. I think this one could be solved if the files were still there. But like the Black Dahlia killer, which the reason I'm bringing that up is just a second, like the Black Dahlia killer, I think it could have been solved decades, decades, decades later if the files were still there. Now, there are some still for the Black Dahlia murder, but you can't get to them. The police still says it's an active investigation and won't let people get to them. The reason I bring up Black Dahlia murder is the same kind of stuff. The draining of blood, the brutal decapitation and uh, evisceration of the bodies, the drainings of the blood, the medical precision, the taunting of the police, all of these kind of connect these two cases happened right around the same time. Some people think there might be a connection, but there's not enough proof for anyone to ever say, yeah, this, this serial killer is just a continuation of the Black Dahlia murder. So what did we learn? So could he still be alive? Sure, but he'd be as old as hell, I guess. Um, could it be your grandpa? Sure, why not? Let's go with that. Hey, you know what? If you find out that your grandpa was in the Cleveland area in the 1930s, ask him why he did it and then let me know. See if you can catch your grandpa into confessing to being this this serial killer because, uh, you know, someone had to do it. Why not? You, your grandpa could be the Cleveland torso murderer. If you do, if the, if you do, and they find out the hundred percent, like the police are like going to like look and they're like, oh shit, it really is him. Look, all of these heads are still in the basement, kid. Um, and then he gets convicted of it or dies and he gets convicted of it. I'll send you a free t-shirt. I'll, I'll make a paranormal almanac shirt that says my grandpa was the Cleveland torso murderer. And then you can wear that. All righty. Let's see where we at. Uh, we had 11 for the first one, at least 13 or 14 for the second one. So we're going to round up. Our body count is at 24 and counting. Let's move on to this next one. It's insanely bizarre and could be paranormal. It's a bizarre story. It's the disappearance of Brian Schaefer. Do you know this one? Well, you know what? Shut up anyways, because I already recorded this and I'm about to tell you this story. So whether or not you know this one, also don't skip ahead. Don't be like, well, I know this one. I'm going to skip ahead. Hey, shh, just listen, okay? Just sit back and listen. We go back to the early morning hours of April 1st, 2006, another relatively new one, when 27-year-old Brian Schaefer was captured by CCTV cameras entering the, quote, Ugly Tuna Saloon. And, well hasn't been seen since. That's right. They have him on security camera going into this bar called the Ugly Tuna Saloon. Let me uh, give you a little backstory. Second year medical student at Ohio State, Brian Schaefer, very happy individual, very successful individual with a very pretty girlfriend, went into this bar with his roommate. They have him on camera going in. And get this, on camera, they have everyone but him leaving the bar. That's right. Sometime before 2 a.m., he fucking vanishes. Footage shows him, the roommate, and a friend riding the escalator to the bar's second story entrance at 1.15 a.m. He was seen reemerging outside the bar before 2 a.m., chatting with two women in their 20s right there, still part of the bar, but just outside. Then, they never show him leaving and can account for 
everyone in the bar. Again, according to his friends, this guy was on top of the world. He was doing well in college, had lots of friends, had a girlfriend, no history of depression. His girlfriend and the roommate, Reed, tried calling him several times when he, when he just poof disappeared to no avail. So they go home. The bar closed. They have to get out of here. You know, you can't stay here. You know, you can't stay here, but you don't have to go home, that kind of thing. Well, they go home. Then calls from his father and his friends went unanswered all weekend. Then, on Monday morning, when he misses his flight, that's when he was officially designated a missing person. Now, up to 50 cops searched for him at any one time. His friends and his relatives were questioned, and everyone except his roommate passed a lie detector test because his roommate didn't want to take it. That was the only thing that I was like, wait, what? But it could be because they were like, you know, maybe they were smoking pot or something. The roommate doesn't want to get in trouble for doing that. It... I don't want to say, like, it's the roommate, but I thought that was really weird, so I wanted to make sure I added that. Now, his girlfriend called his cell phone every day, but it went straight to voicemail until one night in September when it actually rang three times. But the wireless provider said it might have been a computer glitch, which was a ping from the phone. Um, So, like, they just said it's probably not him. He's probably not still with his phone. It was probably just a computer glitch. So a lot of armchair detectives go, aha, he still has his phone. He's still out there somewhere. No. The last ping from the phone was detected at a cell tower 14 miles northwest of Columbus. So a little bit farther than where they were, but still not enough to make them go, he had his phone and he's gone. Now the final footage of Brian Schaefer from the security cameras at the Ugly Tuna show him walking off screen and back towards the bar entrance, you know, when he was outside talking to those girls, and then he disappeared. No one knows where he is. It is a very bizarre disappearance. And even, like, the armchair detectives, even though they kind of, like, latched on to the phone rang one time in September for three times, it's not like he answered. It's not like someone else answered his phone. It just rang three times instead of going directly to his phone, uh, his voicemail, But again, the provider, cell phone provider, thinks it was a glitch. All right. Since since his body has never been found and no one knows where he is, I'm not going to include him in the body count, so we're still going to consider it 24 and counting. The next up one, though, you're going to get to uh, figure out really quickly if that body count's going up because it's known as the Strack Family Murder-Suicide. Back in the good old days, ah, crap, no, it's not. Back to 2014. Now, this one kind of starts in 1984. I'm not going to do the little button again. Kind of starts in 1984, though, when a man named Dan Lafferty killed his sister-in-law and her baby. Why did he do it? Well, he said he was directed specifically to kill those two by God himself. Now, it seems that as a child, Christy Strack, from the hence mentioned Strack family, murder-suicide family, Christy Strack became obsessed with Dan Lafferty as a child and never got over her sick obsession. Fun fact, if your celebrity of choice, your celebrity obsession is a murderer, find yourself a better celebrity fascination. Go like, um, I don't know, pick a, pick, pick a celebrity. Go like Keanu Reeves. He's a celebrity you should like. Don't go liking some guy who said, oh, God told me to kill my sister-in-law and her baby. Fuck that guy. Go like Keanu Reeves or Christopher Reeve or any Reeve. Pick a Reeve and like them. Don't like this guy is what I'm saying. All right. Let's um, kind of fast forward. So she gets married. Christy gets married. Is right? Christy? Yeah. Christy gets married to Benjamin and they start a family. Okay. The story got better, but not really, because her and Benjamin would visit Dan Lafferty in prison often. Seriously, how hot do you have to be for your significant other to agree to a visit a murderer in prison often? I can't even get anyone to drive me to the fucking airport, yet she is telling her husband, hey, you know what I want to do tonight, this weekend? You know what I should do? Let's go visit Dan Lafferty, that murderer, in prison. 
because I love them. So Dan and Christy tell Benjamin that, hey, uh, he and Christy are in love. And Dan's like, oh, okay. Or Benjamin's like, oh, okay, you, Dan and Christy, you're in love? Well, okay, that's fine, too. Fucking A. Keep fast forwarding. This sick prison shit keeps happening. Ben and Christy, Christy's kids are growing up, but they pull them out of school for homeschooling because of, quote, a looming apocalypse. And everybody seems fine with that. Nobody stood up and went like, ah, uh, hold on. You can take your kids out of school and homeschool them and make your kid a weirder kid. Sorry, homeschoolers. I'm just going by the bulk. The bulk of homeschoolers I know are weird kids. Uh, but, you know, you could take them out because you want your kid to, like, learn more about, you know, the world rather than, you know, America's fucked up past or whatever. But if you say the reason you're doing it is because of a looming apocalypse that's being told to you by a known murderer, someone step up and say, no, thank you. Anyhow, these two idiots, Benjamin and Christy, speak frequently to family and friends about, quote, leaving this world and its evils. So, as you can guess from the name of this one, it doesn't end well when their 19-year-old son, who was out with his friends, comes home, and he had to push the door because the front door because there was something blocking it. Yeah. He sees the bodies of his entire family, and he calls the police. Now, they find a to-do list scribbled in a notebook with notes like feeding the the pets and finding someone to watch the house, almost like they were ready to go out on vacation, not like they were going to murder and suicide everybody in the family. They find dozens of pills and empty flu and cold medicine bottles littered around the home, but some st- a lot of sites say that Benjamin killed himself with heroin, so he went really off the deep end. Um, all five family members have ingested basically a fatal mixture of drugs in a parent in apparent murder suicide. Even though this one is still considered a mystery, it seems pretty straightforward to me. The only mystery I don't understand is how you marry someone fascinated with a murderer and convinces you to come and hang out with them. I can't get past that part, but um. All right, whatever the body count is. Well, we're 24, now we're at four more, 28. All right, this next one, thankfully, doesn't have a body count. It's just weird as hell. For this one, we go all the way back to 2007 in Furcrest, Washington. Again, relatively new. 16-year-old Courtney Kukendall began receiving texts from her friends going, hey, why did you just text me with the word gay? Which is just dumb. Uh, but it confuses her because she was like, I didn't. I didn't send you, I didn't send that text to anybody. And she went and checked her phone and cl- sure enough, she didn't send these texts, but they all, all her friends are like, hey, I got it too. Hey, I got it too. Weird, but not mysterious enough for this episode yet. Cut to Courtney, her friends, and her family, all of them started receiving threatening text messages and phone calls from an unknown person who they all later referred to as restricted because that's what came up on caller ID. So as soon as restricted began their calls, they would regularly threaten to kill or rape whoever answered the call, answered the phone or threaten to attack the schools they attended or threaten to kill their pets. So F you to restricted. Now the calls and texts happened around the clock They would take place on both the family's landlines and their cell phones. Pretty much everyone involved all got new phones and new numbers or had their phones shut off. But you guessed it, restricted didn't stop. At one point, after Courtney and her family called the police and after finally having enough of the harassment, while in the middle of explaining their situation to an officer... All their phones turned on and called each other. See, told you, it gets weirder. They're talking to the police, all of their phones turn on and start calling each other. Even weirder. The police traced the threatening threatening messages and texts back to Courtney's own phone. But thankfully, her family was getting the messages and calls while Courtney was with them, And her phone was off. Then, 
even weirder. The whole family had just returned home after meeting with local law enforcement about the escalating violent nature of the calls when they noticed they had a voicemail. And when they got home, they're like, oh, we got a voicemail. So they boop, they press play. It consisted of a recording of the exact conversation from earlier that day in the police station. So, getting weirder. Now, her phone, our parents, obviously, they take her phone away. Yep, you guess it. Restricted keeps calling. Restricted, though, isn't just calling them. Restricted also seems to be able to see them, even when they were inside their home. Then they get a new security system for the home because they're actually being smart. As soon as it gets installed, Restricted calls them and tells the family their passcode to it. And Restricted was obviously right about it. Then Restricted made comments about the family, what they were wearing, and it wasn't just the family. It was doing it, it, they were doing it to the friends as well. There is one, like every website about this, all, all mentions this one. One time, Restricted um, was talking to a victim, quote-unquote victim. Well, that's not quote-unquote. It's a victim. Fuck that. It's, quote, victim. Screw that. To victim Andrea McKay, who was cutting limes on the counter one time, Restricted messages her saying, I prefer lemons. All right. Getting towards the end of this one. One night, an unknown person banged on the side of the family's house before running off into the night. At this point, taping their camera lenses and even removing the batteries from their phones failed to stop restricted. That's right. Even if they covered the camera lenses, removed the batteries from the phones, restricted would still know things about them and could see them somehow. Then, just as quickly as it began... The calls started to trail off and then stopped altogether. No one to this day knows who Restricted is or how they managed to do it. There's a couple of armchair detectives that think it was like some ex-boyfriend or something. but And the police were like, we think it's some teenage boy with a lot of skills. That's a lot of skills to have. Because it's not just cloning one cell phone. If that was it, I'd be like, yeah, okay, I could see it being an ex-boyfriend. But all this shit this thing, this restricted did, and being able to monitor all these multiple people, and somehow getting the phone conversation, or getting the conversation that they had with the police, recording it, and then sending it as well. Like, there's too many steps for this just to be some, you know, douchebaggy little ex-boyfriend boy. But thankfully... No body count. So let's go on to the next one. Now this next one happened in South Dakota in 1992 when Arnold Archambo, his girlfriend Ruby, and Ruby's cousin Tracy had all been drinking and crashed their car into a ditch. Don't drink and drive. When help arrived, Tracy suddenly realized, uh, crap, I'm alone. Ruby and Arnold weren't anywhere in or around the car. That seems like a really odd thing to suddenly realize, but it's what it says, so I'm going to pass it along that way. So police investigators walk through the ditch multiple times, both ways, in search of the couple with no luck. Then, cut to three months later, a passing motorist saw a body 75 feet where the crash occurred in a spot that was searched multiple times by multiple police officers. It was Ruby's body. Then, even weirder, not long after that, investigators find the body of Arnold, too. It's even weirder. Investigators said they were confused when they determined that they don't think the the couple died in the ditch. They were like, okay, we found their bodies, but we don't think they actually died here. First... There was a witness who came forward who said that she saw Arnold at a party three weeks after he was reported missing. Then, Ruby and Arnold's body appeared to be in different stages of decomposition. The coroner concluded that both died of exposure, but neither the investigators nor the victim's family are convinced to this day. Everybody involved in this say, what the hell happened to them? 
There is no reasonable explanation ever given for their deaths. Told you, that one was weird. So with that, the body count is what? 28 plus 2, 20, it's 30? It's either 20, it's either 28 or 30. I'm going to say 30. Okay. For this last one. No, no, it's not the last one. I apologize. For this next one. Let's go back to 1987, to 16-year-old Kathy Hobbs, who sadly was murdered coming home from buying a paperback novel from, uh, I believe, a gunshot wound to the head, but I didn't write it down, but I think that's what it was. Now, here's the weird thing, though. After her death, her parents and her friends said that for all her life, Kathy had suffered from, quote-unquote, premonitions of her murder when she was a teen. They said... All her life, she had premonitions that when she was a teen, she was going to get murdered. It got so bad that in her teen years, she developed agoraphobia, rightfully so. And in case you don't know what that means, she doesn't want to leave the house. Rightfully so. But on her 16th birthday, for some reason, she believed the curse had been broken. I don't get that. 16 still has teen in it. I wouldn't have left my house until my 30s just to be on the safe side. Um, uh, let's, so I guess the lesson here is, you know, listen to your premonition, sadly, because that's the end of this one. They, they, they know who murdered her. I think I I can't, if I remember correctly, they, they found who murdered her. But the point of this whole one is that she had premonitions her entire life of being murdered in her teens. And then sadly was murdered in her teens. Oh, is that 20? It's either 31 or 29. I'm going to say 31. And so let's move on to the last one though. This last one. We go to Minnesota in 2008. It's called The Disappearance Disappearance of Brandon Swanson. So Brandon was driving to a friend's party when he crashed into a ditch. He couldn't get his car back out. He wasn't injured. The car really wasn't damaged at all. It was just at an angle that it couldn't get traction to get back out. So he calls his dad to come pick him up, telling him he thinks he's near you know this town. But when his dad got there... He was like, no, he's not near him. But he, but Brandon's still on the phone. So Brandon is talking, walking and talking, describing that he saw what he sees. He says, oh, there's a city up the road. He thinks he's heading, um, to, you know, like, I know where I'm heading. I think I know where I'm going. Come pick me up here. Still talking to his dad, still coherent. And he said he planned to take a shortcut through some fields to get to this city as opposed to, you know, opposed to staying on the main road. Bad idea. Just stay on the main main road. Look. American Werewolf in London, if it taught you anything, it's to stay on the main road. But during the call, he told his father he'd pass several fences and gravel roads. He said he could also hear water running in the distance, which was odd because that wasn't in the area where he said he was, where his dad was driving to. Then 47 minutes later into the call, Brandon says, oh shit, and the phone goes dead. Now, his car was later found abandoned in the ditch, as he had described, but no city could have been in the area where he was walking towards, which is very weird. So, law enforcement personnel and volunteers eventually searched the region on horseback, on foot, using all-terrain vehicles. They also used search dogs. And they, their theory was, because there's a river right there, their theory was that that oh shit and the phone going dead was Brandon falling into the river and drowning. But the dogs picked his scent up on the other side of the river. Nobody was ever found. And that theory that he fell into the water and either made it back out or drowned has been criticized online by armchair detectives and people with, like, with knowledge of it because his phone seemed to be working after the call with his father was disconnected. The cell towers were still picking it up, which would not have happened if his phone fell into the water. It's also, they also going to say that um, if the phone was submerged in water, all the calls would have gone directly to voicemail, so that doesn't add up. To this day, he is still missing, and no evidence has been found. Very, very bizarre one. He thinks he's in a certain area. He says, Dad, I know exactly where I am. The dad said he was coherent on the phone. Again, he talked for 47 minutes. He was describing things. But where his car was found, he should not have been describing the things that he was seeing. I can get why the police thought, oh, he probably slipped and fell into the river and just drowned. But again, 
experts say the phone wouldn't have done what it did and the phone would have started going directly to voicemail, which it didn't do. So that doesn't seem to have happened. So there you go. Um, horrible body count. That's all you need to know. I don't need to count them up again. It's probably the, the biggest body count on Paranormal Almanac for an any episode. But, I mean, I don't know for sure. But, I mean, it seems like it would be. But, yeah, some seriously bizarre stories, too. These just disappearing either while you were in a bar on security camera or on the phone with your dad and just poof, gone from the world. Those kind of stories freak me out. Still, not as bad as serial killers freak me out. Uh, So a little strange, a little spooky, a lot murdery, but you guys said you wanted scary, murdery stories for Halloween. And frankly, nothing is scarier than a random serial killer. But, um... I don't know how how you women do this, how like women just love these murder podcasts because it's absolutely terrifying. The details, the you know, like I get why any woman would be defensive, you know, walking down any street ever. I get it now. I have always got it, but I get it 100% even more now. Like, you know, guys, leave women alone. That's all I'm saying. Just just stop it. Can you not, can you, don't, don't be a serial killer. How about that guys? The reason I keep saying guys is because there's a damn good chance that the serial killer will turn out to be a white guy. I, you know, I can flat out say I am a white guy and yet I am not a serial killer. So you don't have to be a serial killer. If you're out there being a serial killer, stop it. And then if you could, you know, confess, just give up, just, just turn yourselves in because nothing good's ever going to come from you being a serial killer. All righty. With that one, I hope you guys liked it. It's, um, it was a little bit different, but like I said, this is something that you guys have asked for. And, um, Hey, I'm just giving what you guys asked for. If I, if you guys said, Hey, you know what I really want is an episode on so-and-so and I can do it and I could find the through line, which I can on this one. Cause it's, you know, white guy serial killer, or just mysterious disappearances. So there you go. Uh, There is your latest spooktacular edition of Paranormal Almanac. Ngayon ay ko yung response.